good day again to everyone who is listening in to these media broadcasts which come to you on behalf of the Christians who meet at Limavari Gospel Hall. My name is David McKillen. This is the second of the talks that I am responsible for at this time and we welcome you again to listen to the Gospel message. We're going to read this time in Paul's first letter to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. And before we read the scriptures, which if you have a Bible, you can find your copy and turn to the chapter 1 Corinthians 15. Before we do that, we will again ask for God's blessing upon the reading and proclamation of his word. Father, we give thanks for the opportunity to go on the media in the open air with the gospel. We give thanks that we have freedom so to do. We pray that these freedoms may continue. We pray for places where there are restrictions upon such activities and we pray for Christians who are under persecution and difficulty and war and famine and problems in the world today. Remember our homes, our families, our land and every other land where there is adverse conditions we ask for God's wisdom and guidance and blessing. And remember now, as we turn to the word of God, may it be a comfort to us and may it be a guidance and may it be a provocation to spiritual things to those that listen, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. First Corinthians chapter 15, and we're going to read at verse number 1. Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, and by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. In other words, that unless the gospel itself was a vain thing. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and that he was seen of Peter and then of the twelve and after that he was seen of above five hundred brothers at once of whom the greater part remain unto this day that is at the time at which Paul was writing we leave the reading there and ask God's blessing to be upon it. So it's clear today that the message that we want to bring is the message not only in, but the message of the gospel. The gospel is clearly set out in the paragraph that we have read. Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day. That's not the end of it and he was seen. There are a number of people in the world today and some of them have written quite famous books. Some of them came at it from a journalistic standpoint. Some of them came at it from a forensic standpoint. Uh, and they sat out, set out to write their books and do their research to see if they could prove that the historic Jesus did not rise from the dead. Because if the historic Jesus was a real person who lived, who died about AD 32, who was crucified by the Romans, who had some disciples who followed him, who had a burial in a nowadays unidentifiable tomb, and who did not rise from the dead, then the gospel that has been preached for 2,000 years is a vain thing. And believing the gospel is pointless because it has no foundation. And numerous men, even in recent years, my generation, my lifetime, have set out to write books based upon that thesis. 
that they can prove that the resurrection did not take place and in so doing they can demolish the foundation of the gospel. Some of the books that I have read by those men when they were published, they actually acknowledged the exact opposite. So they turned the very purpose of their book upside down because in researching the Gospels and discovering the number of eyewitness accounts that agreed in what they said and in seeing the deaths to which the early martyrs were willing to go for the faith which they had in a Jesus which many of them genuinely attested to that they had seen him risen after he died these men who were researching believed that the Jesus of the gospel must be true and the gospel message must be genuine what we have in these verses that we have read today is first of all we have the purpose of his destiny Christ died for our sins. In the previous message, if you listen to it, I was talking about the necessity for mediation, a, a tremendous unmeasurable gap between God and humanity, and someone who must come from God's side and take on humanity to be able to stand in the gap and bring the two parties together. Here's a different dimension of the same gospel. The Jesus who came into the world was born somewhere around about AD 0, though the exact date is not known, and whether it was AD 0 or BC 1 or 2, it doesn't really matter nowadays. That's not important. Mind you, it is still significant. They, they talk about the common era. And they talk about before the common era, which are most strange expressions indeed. And yet if you ask someone who used those expressions, excuse me, what's the difference between? And what's the dividing point between the common era and the era that came before? They would have to tell you, well, the dates are divided because of the birth of a person called Jesus Christ. You see, you can't really get rid of it. It is the defining point of history. And his death on the cross at Calvary, 32 years later, and your response to his death is the defining and dividing point of your eternity. Can I say that again? Where you will go and where you will be forever the word of God makes it absolutely clear will be based upon your response to your knowledge of the reason why Jesus died and the reality of who he was and the evidence that he was the Son of God because he rose again from the dead. The purpose of his destiny, Christ died for our sins. The Jewish leaders, when they took him before the Roman governor, they tried to prove that he was guilty of all kinds of made-up crimes. And the Roman governor Pilate himself quickly came to a conclusion that their argument was threadbare. And if there was anything whatsoever that Jesus was guilty of, it was some point of disagreement within Jewish law. But certainly nothing whatsoever to do with civil disobedience. Pilate knew that he was condemning a man to death who was innocent. But Pilate wanted to keep in with the Jews. And so he was willing to let a murderer go free called Barabbas. And he was willing to put an innocent man called Jesus to death on the very same cross. 
Pilate stands accountable for eternity for the decision that he made in relation to who Jesus was. And I have very little doubt from the information that the Gospels give us that Pilate had some degree of insight into the fact that Jesus, the Galilean prophet from Nazareth, was something just more than that. That he was more than an ordinary man. That he came from outside this world. And he was the only person who ever stood before Pilate who was able to declare to Pilate absolute truth. It's not that we are totally honest from within ourselves because none of us can be. We are hypocrites even to ourselves. But when we present to you the gospel of the grace of God, we are not telling something empty or vain. With a broken foundation, we are telling something that is absolutely sound and secure and true and will last for eternity, the purpose of his destiny, Christ's death. The proof of his death, he was buried. His own disciples were absolutely clear that he had died. They had no doubt about it whatsoever. All kinds of strange stories have been put about in recent days that Jesus swooned upon the cross. No. The professional Romans who carried out crucifixions on a daily basis were absolutely sure that their prisoners were dead because their jobs depended on it. His disciples, who would have very much wished for him to stay alive, were absolutely clear that he was dead. And every single one of them for three days was broken hearted that the person that they had followed and believed in as Messiah was dead within the grave. They came to anoint the dead body. They didn't come looking for a risen body, though he had told them, according to the scriptures, that he would rise. So when he was buried, it was the proof of his death. But when he rose again the third day, it was the power of his deity. That's wonderful, isn't it? The evidence that Jesus Christ was the Son of God is not only his death on the cross. The evidence that Jesus Christ was and is the Son of God was the empty tomb and his visible resurrection. It was not simply that the tomb that they knew that his body had been put in. Mind you, there was no possibility of mistake about the tomb. Not then. Because the Jews went to the Romans and they said, we're frightened that his disciples will do a subterfuge and steal the body because of certain things that he said three years ago. And so will you give us a guard? And Pilate said, I'll not only give you a guard, I'll put Rome's seal upon that stone tomb. So the tomb that Jesus' body was in was identified as different from every single tomb in Jerusalem. They could not have come on the third day, on the Sunday morning, to the wrong tomb. One that had not been used. Because the tomb that Jesus' body was inside was sealed with a Roman seal and guarded by a Roman guard. But the disciples came on the third morning expecting to further embalm and anoint the body. And they found the tomb empty. The guard gone. The seal broken. No body within. The stone rolled. And angels sitting in the tomb telling them, Why are you seeking a living person Amongst dead people, he is not here. He is risen, as he told you that he would. The power of his deity, he rose again from the dead. And the proclamation of his disciples. That's what Paul's emphasising here. He was seen. First by Peter, then by others on one occasion by more than 500. 
Oh, for one, it could be wish fulfilment. For one, it could be their imagination putting clothes or misidentification. Oh, we could understand that. But more than 500 believers at once being convinced. That the person they were standing around was the Jesus, the Messiah, who had died and who had risen from the dead and had come back in a bodily form. That the scripture tells us they had touched, they had handled, they had pressed his flesh and felt the bones beneath the flesh. Their hands did not go through a, a, a fantasy, a ghostly figure. And he was capable of sitting with them and lighting a fire and making breakfast and eating and drinking. What an amazing thing. And yet in that glorified body after 40 days they were able to testify that they saw ascending him. They saw him ascending back up to heaven. The purpose of his destiny. Christ Jesus came into the world to see it. Christ Jesus came to die as heaven had determined. Christ died for our sins. The proof of his death, he was buried. The power of his deity, he rose again. The proclamation of his disciples, he was seen. Let me ask you today, if you have travelled with us to the conclusion of this little media message, what are you going to do with the evidence and the witness? And the proclamation over 2,000 years of the truth, of the reality, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can say, I don't need him. You can say, I don't want him. You can say, I can travel through my little life without him. Yes, you can. But you will not come to death. And the judgment after death and eternity with any degree of safety or certainty or hope without Jesus Christ as your Saviour. If you will not take him now to be your Saviour who can forgive your sin, you will stand before him one day as your judge. And you will be condemned by the same person for the sins that could have been forgiven and were not because you refused the testimony of the one who came, the one who died, the one who rose again, the one who went back to heaven, the one who's going to come and the one who has been testified about for 2,000 years. May God bless his word to you everyone who listens and may you even go like the disciples did and share his word with others may god bless you all and thank you for listening